All right, folks. Uh, welcome to week five. Okay. I'll go ahead and uh, set the stage for you here. First off, we're going to go through and just a quick overview of what was covered in the lecture. Uh, and then we're going to talk, we're going to have a question and answer session, and then we will talk about uh, what's to be done with the essays this week. All right, so uh, let's start off here. So week five, to, this week we were talking about apply, applying debate technique to argument. Okay, so let's let's begin. So as far as debate goes, you may have a passing familiarity with it from political debates where candidates make the case for their election. Uh, that's where most Americans are going to find their debate content is from uh it's from political debate, okay? Debate is a performative form of argument where oratory skills become equally as important as the point you're making and the logic you bring to bear for your argument, okay? So uh, your debaters are still reliant on the main logical appeals. That is pathos, ethos, and logos. Uh, written, written arguers are just as uh, reliant on those. Debaters are also still just as prone to logical fallacies. In fact, I would go so far as to say debaters are probably more prone than them just based on the fact that they're usually making things up on the fly and they're trying to justify those arguments as they go along. Uh, there's a lot of potential there that they could slip and slip into a uh, fallacious argument. By looking at how debates work, some of the elements can be applied to parts of any argument essay. So what we're going to do is take a look at the basics of how formal debate is supposed to work. That isn't to say how it actually works in the real world, because most times in the real world, it doesn't work the way you want it to. Uh, a lot of people like to break the rules all the time. OK, but uh, we're going to take a look at what it's supposed to be like uh, so that you have an idea of how you can apply this to writing an argument. OK, so. Let's talk about debate structure. Now, when you're talking about debating, it has a particular structure for how topics are chosen and how arguments are cited. Now, the basic debate structure goes like this, and just keep in mind this is, this is geared toward uh, competitive debate, okay? Uh, like you would see with debate teams in high school, okay? So first, you have a, a topic chosen. It's typically called the resolution or the motion. In the case of classical arguments and most other written forms, this is going to be the premise. Okay, this is your basic argument. What are you trying to prove? Okay, what, or really, what is the subject that you need to argue over? Okay. Uh, teams argue affirmative and negative. Okay, so are you giving it a yay or a nay? Okay, in debate competitions, this is usually determined by a coin flip. Okay, so there's no guarantee you'll agree with the side you wind up on, but you will still have to argue on its behalf. Now, if you're writing an argument, you have the luxury of being able to choose your side and be conscious of what side you're actually choosing and choose a side that you believe in. Whereas if you were in a competitive debate uh, situation, you have to work with what you're given. Teams typically have an hour to prepare and speak for a set time limit per member. Typically, the debate runs in three rounds, uh, one round for each member of a team. Typically, debate, mem debate teams are uh, in teams of three, okay? So teams have an hour to prepare, okay? Uh, speakers alternate between sides, but the affirmative side always goes first, okay? So whatever team is designated as affirmative to the motion, they're going to be the ones that speak first. Uh, followed by the first negative, so on and so forth. We'll talk about that in a minute. The audience of debaters are primarily tailoring their arguments toward is the debate judge. Okay. Now, theoretically, what the judge is supposed to do is not take a side. Uh, he does. He's not supposed to have an opinion on the topic being debated. Instead, he is strictly there supposed to judge the quality of the arguments made. That is, say how logical they are. Uh, how well they avoid uh, drifting into fallacious thoughts, how well they use their facts, if their evidence is sufficient, so on and so forth. However, judges are human, though, so you need to keep in mind their inherent biases may come into play 
when they start judging teams, especially if it's a subject that they know about. Okay? Let's talk the roles of each speaker. Okay, because the teams are usually made up of speakers for each side. There's a particular role and order for each member of the team. Okay? Uh, starting with the first affirmative. Okay? This is the first speaker of the debate. Uh, this person contextualizes the debate, sets out the team's interpretation, defines terminology if necessary, and outlines the argument and the team split. Uh, they say they tell you who is going to deliver what argument, and then provides two to three arguments of their own supporting the motion. Uh, so they're basically setting the table here. They're telling you what the background is of the argument, why the debate exists. Okay. That's followed by the first negative, okay? Uh, the uh, opponent's equivalent to the first affirmative, okay? First negative recontextualizes the debate as a rebuttal to affirmative, including differing definitions, okay? So they are going to try to give you the other side's perspective on the background, okay? To try to rebut the interpretation that the affirmative side has. Uh, they outline the argument and the team split, just like the first affirmative did. But then they rebut the argument made by the first affirmative and provide two to three arguments opposing the motion. Okay, so they are directly going to address the first affirmative's argument and rebut that. Uh, the seconds for each team rebut the previous speaker, clarify their definitional issues, and deliver two to three more arguments. Okay, uh, so every speaker is re directly rebutting the speaker ahead of them. Okay, then finally you get to the thirds. The thirds for each team specifically rebut the seconds and then specifically respond to attacks from the opposition. Uh, and finally, they conclude with a brief summary of their team's argument and reasoning. Now, in the lecture video, I mentioned that the thirds are keeping a gripe list. Uh, this is primarily keeping track of all of the things that the opposition said that is inherently wrong, either because it has a fallacy to it or it just uh, is counter to... Uh, evidence is present. Okay. Uh, they they present basically that gripe list in their turn. Okay. All right. So how does apply to written arguments? Well, it can be argued that each of the members of a debate team is producing their own short argumentative essay and presenting it orally. But what we're going to take a look at here is the full debate in a holistic manner and compare it to a written argument. Okay. So the firsts are presenting the background for the argument and its bigger picture meaning, which is what you're supposed to do with your introduction. Although there is a bit of dispute that takes place between them, it also emphasizes the differences between the sides. Okay? So you're setting the table here. You're trying to say, here's the background information on this uh, issue, on this argument. This is why we disagree. This is what our obsession says. This is what, we, this is what our position is. Okay? Seconds are presenting organized arguments to support the team's main premise using logical reasoning and evidence to support the premise. They're also rebutting the opposition using logical reasoning and evidence. Okay, so this is the meat of the argument here. This in a written classical argument, this is where you get your reasoning for uh, believing in your side of the argument, the evidence that backs up those reasons, which in turn backs up the argument. <clears throat> okay. And then the thirds are offering the fullest rebuttal possible to the opposition while also concluding their team's argument with a brief summary and overview. Uh, it would also be their job to offer the parting shot that conclusions call for to convince the audience to keep the argument in mind. Okay, So the thirds are doing the job of the full rebuttal. Okay, They're going over the opposition's argument and specifically pointing out this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. Here's the evidence that proves that I'm right and you're wrong. Okay. And then finally, you have the parting shot. Okay, uh, the, this is this is how we're going to leave the audience uh, realizing there's some action to be taken. Let's leave a lasting impression on them. Okay. Uh, so we get to basic debate argument structure. So the very basic structure that debaters use for their arguments is also highly helpful for writers because it helps you with each particular reason that you present. Okay, so each reason is going to start with a claim, okay, uh, where you present the argument in a clear manner with a clear statement, 
Okay? So this is your reason that's going to back up your argument. Then follow that with the evidence, the facts supporting the claim, including statistics, references, quotes, and so on. Any factual information that's going to back up your claim, that's going to back up that reason, okay? That's what you present here. Third one, you don't really see this a lot in written works, but it's possible you could use it. It's impact. What significance each piece of evidence has for the claim? So what's, what part of that claim is going to be proven correct by each piece of evidence? Okay? Uh, again, claims in this case would be equivalent to reasons for supporting a side of an argument. Thus, the structure could be used for each part of an argument essay and offer a logical backing for the ideas presented. Okay? Now let's talk about rebuttal. Okay? In a debate setting, rebuttal is typically limited to pointing out the logical shortcomings of the opposition and how claims may not hold up to high, tiger scrutiny. Okay? Uh, there are some logical fallacies mentioned. Uh, that are present in competitive debates. They're similar to ones that appear in written arguments as well. Okay, this isn't the if no means a comprehensive list here, but let's take a look at some of these uh, fallacies, and these are things that you need to avoid. Okay, so one is the false dichotomy. So this is the either-or fallacy. Okay, in this case, you're splitting the debate into a two-sided issue when there are multitudes of other options. Okay, uh, while it's true that you've already been split into two sides uh, at the start of the debate. This is more for wider picture issues where there may be more shades of gray. Okay. Uh, then we have the assertion. Uh, statements that are not backed up by evidence are typically assumptions. Okay. This is where we have inherent biases coming in. You're presenting an idea that you assume is correct, but you have no evidence to prove that that assumption is correct. Uh, you have nothing but, oh, this this particular thing I feel so strongly about that it has to be real, okay? It doesn't work that way in logic, okay? Uh, then we have morally flawed. Statements and arguments that are questionable in their distribution of fairness and or morality, okay? Uh, if you have are responding to an argument that is outright immoral in terms of uh, what, it's, what it's proposing, uh, what kind of uh, issues in terms of like discrimination or fairness may come up in regards to that argument? This is where that more this morally flawed fallacy comes into play. You can actually call people on this. Okay, you can call them on this, especially if it's something that they're trying to use fact to back up. Okay, because most likely you can also use those same facts to back it up the other way. Okay. Uh, we have correlation versus causation. Just because uh, just because A happens and B and B happens does not mean that A causes B to happen. Okay, uh, that's a big deal here because uh, we're talking about uh, false uh, uh, false correlation. Okay, so again, correlation does not uh, correlation does not equal causation. Okay. All right, so. Uh, next one, failure to deliver promises. The speaker has promised evidence that they have not produced. Okay. Uh, if, they, if, if the speaker has said that they're going to prove a point, uh, that they're going to use facts to prove this point, and they haven't done it, then you call them on that. You call them on using their facts in the wrong way. You call them on not using enough facts. You call them on not proving their point. Uh, then we have the straw man, creating a false, exaggerated version of the opposition that's easier to attack. We've talked about this one before, uh, where you are trying to make yourself look more reasonable by making your opposition look like a fool, okay? By using an argument that's more extreme than what they have than what they have initially proposed. Then we have the contradiction fallacy, pre presenting two conflicting arguments that cancel each other out, just reduce thus reducing the side's credibility, okay? Uh, the contradiction fallacy kind of rarely works uh, in writing, but it's especially effective in debate because you're dealing with multiple people making an argument for one side. It is possible that two people will come up with arguments that are directly contradictory to each other. Okay. Uh, then finally, you have comparing the conclusion to reality. The conclusion presented is oversimplified and may have further complications if put into effect. 
Okay, so uh, if you have this issue, uh, you're basically looking at things through rosy uh, through rosy outlooks, and what you're actually what you're actually wind up is, uh, not accounting for everything that could be uh, not accounting for everything that could occur. Okay, so. To give you an example of this from pop culture, uh, so if you, I don't, I doubt there's anybody here who is uh, not familiar with The Simpsons at this point. About eight or nine years ago, there was an episode of The Simpsons that involved uh, Homer Simpson being elected as the sanitation director of Springfield, uh, as the uh, head of the sanitation department. Okay, he won that election. He got into the election basically because he had a beef with the current. Uh, sanitation director who was refusing to pick up his garbage because Homer kept insulting him. Uh, so eventually what happens is that Homer uh, runs for a sanitation uh, chief and he wins. And his campaign basically does a lot of pandering to the sanitation workers themselves. Uh, in fact, one of the things that he follows up with with his promises is he buys them all new trucks uh, and he buys them shining lily white uniforms, and this is all well and good for maybe about three days. Uh, and this is at the point where you have this conclu compare conclusion to reality fallacy kick in because by fulfilling all of those promises, what Homer has actually done is bankrupted the department. So to the point where they can't pay the salaries for the sanitation workers, and you have the same problem that was happening before where garbage is piling up again. Uh, eventually, uh, by the end of the episode, Homer's had to resign the position, and it goes back to the guy that he beat in the election, okay, uh, who is uh, a little vindictive over it, okay? Uh, but that's what I'm talking about here, where you can talk about this compare the conclusion to reality fallacy. You're accusing your opposition of oversimplifying their case and trying to put this rosy picture out when it's not going to be that rosy. It's, there's going to be complications. It's going to be felt on down the line. Very butterfly effect. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that gets us to important skills for debating. For a debater to be successful, there's some elements that need to be present in their argument. For the purposes of writing arguments, though, this comes down to the following. Okay. These are the uh, important skills that affect both oral debate and written debate. Okay. So first off, make points relevant to the topic. Okay. Uh, second, provide evidence when you can, not just your own personal opinion. Okay. Everything that you uh, make a point of saying in your argument has to be backed up by facts. Okay. There's no getting around that. Uh, third, remain objective when arguing. Passionate arguments can become illogical, so control your emotions. Okay. Now, I know this kind of goes counter to what I said at the start of the semester, where I said that I believe that people write better if they feel more passionately about something. Uh, there is a corollary to that, and, and that is if you're trying to make a logical argument, uh, that can have a tendency to bite you in the butt. If you are uh, too passionate about it, you're going to be less likely to fact check things and more likely to just act on impulse and argue on impulse. Okay, We don't want that happening. Okay, uh, next one, remain objective when our, oh wait, I said that. Consider the audience's attention span, okay? Uh, I use Hamilton in the uh, lecture as the example for this. Uh, you want to make sure that you are saying within your uh, audience's attention span, you're not going to lose them, you're not going to drone on and on and on and on and on and completely lose your audience uh, so that they're not listening to you and not taking in the points of your argument that you want to make. Okay, so consider how much of an attention span they have. The average person's attention span tends to run anywhere from 15 to 35 minutes tops, okay, unless it's something that can really hold their attention for a long period of time, okay? Very rarely can a speaker do that, okay? Uh, ethos and logos to support your rhetoric, okay? Uh, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, appeals to... Uh, motion appeals to ethics uh, or credentials appeal to logic. Okay. Mm. 
uh, employ comparative thinking. How would things be different if the opposition wins or, or if the status quo remains versus if you win? Okay. How are things going to change? Uh, what, what's going to be different? How are things going to be better if your side wins versus how are things going to be worse if they remain the same or if your opposition wins? Okay. Uh, keep your language simple. Uh, we've talked previously about uh, addressing stuff to the, to the stupidest person in the room. Try to uh, keep your language. Don't go into any fun language tricks. Uh, don't use a ex extraneously flowery language, a lot of jargon, anything like that. Anything is going to lose your audience. And if you're trying to prove yourself to be the smartest person in the room, uh, don't force your vocabulary on the people in the room that may have a uh, sub-50 IQ. Okay, so keep it, keep it simple so that everybody understands. Uh, avoid hyperbole. Don't use terms like always or never. Okay? Don't make things the best, the worst, uh, absolutely horrible, absolutely wonderful, so on and so forth. Any kind of hyperbolic statement cannot take place in a uh, good logical argument. Okay? We all know somebody who does this a lot. Please do not be like him. Uh, finally, avoid fallacious argument techniques, okay? This includes things like falsifying data or evidence, okay? Uh, people get into serious trouble when they do this. Do not, under any circumstances, use questionable data or make up your own numbers, okay? A uh, very famous example of this involves a fellow by the name of Andrew Wakefield, okay? Uh, name sounds familiar. It's because he's basically of the anti-vax movement, okay? Uh, he is best known for submitting a uh, uh, paper to a medical journal called The Lancet, where he linked the MMR vaccine to uh, an increased chance of uh, autism in infants. Okay, uh, And this got a lot of attention, and again, it really started the anti-vax movement. Well, here's the problem. Uh, Andrew Wakefield used absolute absolutely crummy numbers okay uh he did not have full disclosure about his paper because the research that he was doing was funded by a pharmaceutical company who was having him test an up uh, a uh, competitor's mmr vaccine because they wanted to prove that their own mmr vaccine was safer than the other the uh competitions okay uh second wakefield did not have a large enough sample size he only test he only uh did his study on 12 infants, okay? When the uh, numbers that he was getting did not match up with his theory, with his thesis, uh, instead of altering the thesis, which is what uh, anybody with ethics would do, uh, he actually changed his numbers to match what his argument was so that he would look right, okay? Uh, and that's an absolute no-no. So there were huge repercussions after this. Uh, the Lancet wound up retracting the paper, okay, even though it had gone through, it had gone through uh, rigorous peer review. Uh, apparently, their rigorous peer review wasn't rigorous enough, okay? The other thing that happened specifically to Wakefield is that he lost his medical license, okay? Uh, and he sh that should have been the end to him, but he continues to be a prominent anti-vax speaker, and he's still spreading around this thing that uh, this idea that the MMR vaccine causes autism, which has been hugely debunked by study after study after study that could not replicate Wakefield's results because Wakefield was using falsified data. Okay. So do not use falsified data or evidence in a argument. Okay. Uh, then uh, another one attacking the arguer for the opposition rather than the opposing argument. Okay, uh, this is the ad hominem fallacy. We do not want to commit that. Stick with the argument. Do not b make it into a personal attack on the opposition. Uh, and then third, disagreeing with facts or obvious truths. This is uh, the modern phenomenon of alternative facts. Okay. Uh, just because a fact hurts your feelings does not mean it's any less a fact. Okay. Uh, you cannot argue with anyone who is willing to disregard facts just because it doesn't feel like they should believe them. If, if it's an established fact, it's a fact. Okay? 
All right, so that gets us to the last part of this, and that is the exercise that I want you guys to do uh, to uh, post. Okay. Uh, now, this is involving debate, uh, looking at historical debates. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, there's some typical examples of how the average person experiences debate is going to be through political debate. So you're going to take a look at some debate examples that I provide the links for and look for elements that we've talked about in the lecture. And I also played these debates in the lecture, okay? So you can observe them and you can take a look and look for these things. I wanted you to post your observations to the thread that I started in questions to the professor. Uh, so this is what they're doing right. It could also be anything that you see them doing wrong, any kind of fallacies that they commit. Okay, so uh, the first one of these was the 1960 presidential debate. Uh, it's a snippet from it between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, okay? Uh, this was the first presidential debate televised nationally, and it has a distinction that it was both broadcast on television and on the radio. And depending on how you uh, took it in, it, did, it tended to dictate how you felt the candidates did, because most of the television viewers felt that Kennedy won the debate, but most of the radio viewers felt, radio listeners felt that Nixon won it. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, a one video that has highlights from several debates uh, from uh, 1976 to 2008. Uh, I'll give you an overview of what these, what the snippets are. Uh, so first, first debate here, 1984, Reagan versus Mondale. Uh, this was this is the particularly famous zinger that uh, Reagan got in on Mondale uh, when he mentioned that he is not going to hold his opponent's youth and inexperience against against him and uh, make age an issue in the in the presidential race. Uh, the joke being here that Reagan was pushing 70 and Mondale was 64. Okay. Uh, 1976 Ford versus Carter. Uh, this is the snippet here. Is particularly well-known gaffe or committed in that uh, in that particular debate uh, when he tried to claim that Yugoslavia, Poland, and Hungary were not part of the Soviet bloc, which in fact, when in fact they actually were. Okay. Uh, then we have 1988, uh, Dan, uh, Lloyd Benson versus Dan Quayle. This is a vice presidential debate. Uh, probably the best known exchange in this debate where you have uh, Quayle. Uh, Dan Quayle uh, basically compared himself to John F. Kennedy because of his youth being a, a younger candidate uh, for national office. Uh, to which Lloyd Benson, who had actually served in Congress with Kennedy, uh, made this response. He said, Senator, I, Senator, I, know, I knew Jack Kennedy. I served with, with him. Uh, Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. You, sir, are no Jack Kennedy. Okay. Uh, this was a big uh, zinger line for him. Okay. Uh, then we have 1988 Bush Sr. versus Dukakis. Uh, this is the uh, first question of the debate. It was directed to Dukakis, and it was asking him uh, if he would support a death penalty if his wife were raped, or mur raped and murdered. Uh, this one's actually largely considered one of the... Uh, uh, worst cheap shots in a uh, presidential debate. Uh, and the weird part about it is it was a cheap shot that was delivered by the moderator and not by either of the candidates. Okay. Uh, next one, 1992, Gore versus Quayle versus Stockdale. This was a three-way debate. Uh, this was a presidential debate. Stockdale was running uh, as the running mate to H. Ross Perot, who was running as the Reform Party candidate, the third party. And the clip here is Stockdale's opening statement, where he appears to trail off and have a war flashback before putting his glasses back on and uh, continuing to read his statement. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is 2008. It's uh, Joe Biden versus Sarah Palin, another vice presidential debate. Uh, in this particular one, it was a question in regards to... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question was, but uh, Biden's initial response is talking about middle class neighborhoods uh, because he consider he still considers himself middle class uh, because of his upbringing and no knowing those middle class neighborhoods. Uh, and Palin's response to that uh, is kind of 100% nonsensical and uh, takes 
takes more time to uh, give a shout out to a third grade elementary school class than it does to actually answering the question. Okay. Uh, the last link here is to a uh, debate on the floor of the British House of Commons from 2009 uh, between uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown and David Cameron. I list him as Speaker of the House of Commons. Uh, David Cameron was actually just the opposition leader, uh, opposition party leader. Uh, the way the British Parliament the House works is that the Speaker of the House is actually uh, supposed to be an impartial judge uh, who is overseeing the debate to try to keep things civil. Okay, uh, But the fun part about this one is that uh, Brown and Cameron just go back and forth and back and forth, and while they are actually talking about issues, they're also taking the time to insult each other. Let's be frank here. Uh, so. Uh, it's kind of interesting to watch, uh, especially because everybody around them is egging them on uh, for, from each man's individual parties. Uh, and at least one comment on the video compares uh, this particular debate more to a rap battle than a political debate. Uh, and it would be hard to disagree with that assessment. All right, so that does it for uh, the slides and for the lecture. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions, we'll do a brief uh, about uh, 10 minutes worth of questions here. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand so I can recognize you. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we, what we need to be doing as far as drafts go. So if you have a question, raise your hand, please. Uh, yeah, Ed, what's the question? Uh, for our bibliographies, for our papers, how do you want us to do them? Uh, I gave you the link for Purdue OWL. Oh, okay. uh, you need to you consult that. OK. They, um, they give you the full instructions on how to do that there. Uh, and I, want, I, want, I would like you to do it in the format as they prescribe it. Uh, if I can get this to the right size. There we go. There we go. All right, so that so that's the uh, URL for the Purdue Owl. Uh, look in their MLA style guide, and it'll give you the information you need for com for coming up with those listings, uh, the proper formatting for them, and how to do the citations in the in the text. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, I think that's it. Okay. All right. All right. What's what's your question? Yeah, I I see you there. I think we're having some uh, signal issues with you. Uh, let's go ahead with your question. Yes, my question is that the uh, do we uh, do you going to provide a place for us to like submit our paper? I'm going to talk about that in a minute here. Uh, once okay. you get, I'm going to go through all that. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, I'm going to get, give me some questions here. Uh, this is the this is the question session. So, any questions you have about the uh, 
uh, essay coming up or the uh, lecture slides or anything. Uh, just hop in the, just, uh, bring them up for me. All right, Samuel, I see you there. What's your question? Uh, so I just wanted to make sure it was okay. I'm still putting some revisions on my paper before I post it to the um, to the group, our group chat, our team group chat. Uh, I wanted to make sure that was okay if I submit it at the end of the day. I uh, I have some revisions, but immediately after this uh, session, I have to go to work, and then I'll come back and I'll add my revisions, and then it'll be done. I just wanted to yeah, make sure that was okay. Yeah, that's fine. The group, the group tomorrow so you should be okay okay thank you mm -hmm. and uh, I also I double I asked the group uh, but then they told me that there was no specific topic I had to add but I did want to make sure because I had had that problem in the past uh, where I was writing about something that was not supposed to be written about um, I wanted to make sure so it's it's a topic that has to be argued it's not it's not specific yeah. to any topic is it yeah the only the only yeah. suggestion I made was to make it something uh, that to be uh, from current events, which would make it a little easier for you to do the research on. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. All right, so showing that my uh, signal is going down in quality here, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get what you guys need to do for the uh, essays uh, now before my uh, signal decides to drop me. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. All right, where is it? There it is. Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, so first off, uh, this is the second workshop week for these uh, essays. Uh, assuming that everybody has uh, submitted once for revisions, uh, this week was for proofreading and editing. Uh, it's basically polish and cleanup. So there should be no uh, issues in regards to uh, content issues, such as readability, such as organization, formatting. Uh, this time around, it's mainly for proofreading, grammar, spelling, and mechanics, okay? Uh, so most people have been doing it right. Uh, just notice I've noticed so that there's a lot of people who are starting new threads to do the workshopping. I'd really prefer that you didn't do that. Uh, I, want you, I want you guys to use the threads that I set up for you or that you guys set up at the start of the semester. That way, it, this doesn't turn into a uh, discussion with 600 threads on it. Okay, uh, so submit. Also, you need to submit your uh, files as a uh, file attachment to a reply to that thread. Okay, uh, so that, that means you also have to make sure of two things. One, you need to make sure that you have a right uh, file format. Uh, so it's .doc, .docx, .pdf, or .rtf. And two, you have to make sure that you have your file physically on your computer. Because as we've discovered, uh, eCampus has a serious issue with trying to process links to cloud systems. Okay, uh, it, it is very old school in nature, so it does not fall with the cloud. Okay? Uh, so make sure you've got a physical copy on your computer that you can upload as an attachment to your reply. Okay? Now, regarding when you, your, your proofreading correction is completed, uh, here's what you do. Uh, under the tab here for major essays and assignments, you're going to click on that. Uh, 
uh, here. There we go. Uh, you have four folders here for argument one, argument two, annotated bib, and propo proposal argument. Uh, we are going to argument one. Okay, you click on that. It opens up this uh, folder. Uh, the link that you need is down here. It's in uh, lavender. It is for the class argument essay. Now take a look at the instructions I have here. Uh, this is going to be where you turn in your classical argument essay. Uh, there's a number of things you have to make sure of before attaching your file. And I let's be clear here. Uh, it, when this link opens, it's going to give you a text box. Do not use that text box. I want you to submit your file, or I want you to submit your essay as a file attachment. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So make sure the following before attaching your file. First off, ensure it's one of the four acceptable file formats. Google Docs users, please make sure your file is saved in one of the acceptable four formats before attaching it. Okay? Uh, this is hugely important. Again, those four formats are the only ones that eCampus can All right? Uh, second instruction, file should contain the following drafts in the following order. Okay? That means you need the full drafts in this order. So as soon as it opens up, the first draft I should see should be your final draft. Uh, follow that with your work setting page. Okay? Uh, after that, you go to the proofreading draft. Then follow that, which is going to be the draft that you submitted to your groups today. Okay? Or today. All right? And then the third draft that should be on in the file is the revision draft. All three of these should be copy pasted into a single file. Okay? So that you can just turn one file in. Okay? Uh, so final draft, then work cited, then the proofreading draft, then finally the revision draft, the one that you posted to your uh, team's thread last week. Okay? Uh, one last thing, the essay should have been fully worked out twice before turning it in. Now, I don't have a lot of control over that. That's mainly going to be up to you guys and whether you're able to get that feedback and give that feedback. Okay? I did make an announcement earlier this week that uh, I was making a workshop participation the way I was going to do the uh, progress report system. Okay? Uh, basically, how it's going to go is as long as you have submitted a file to be workshopped and given feedback, uh, you will receive a satisfactory on that uh, progress report. Anything less than that is going to wind up being unsatisfactory. Okay, so make sure that you submit, if you post a draft, make sure you uh, given and received feedback. Okay, that's also the reason why this link did not open up until today. Okay, that was basically to starting off the week, just sending off a draft that was not proofread. Okay, so uh, make sure. And being posted, uh, you should have them being uh, posted to the uh, assignment once they're proofread. Okay. All right. So now that we're done with that, uh, and I'm still having some signal issues, I noticed. So uh, I'll go ahead and open up to about five more minutes worth of questions, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. So uh, if anybody has any. Any more questions they want to ask uh, about the assignment or about anything? Uh, yeah, I, I saw you, Timus Jim. What's your question? So, uh, so I submitted my essay this morning. Uh, so, when you say in it, uh, we need to submit the rough draft as well as uh, the final draft together, or I, I just submitted the final draft, uh, the final essay. I didn't. I didn't do. I didn't submit the uh, you know, the draft that you're saying that we need to submit as well. Okay. Well, uh, if you submit it on the uh, website, the, the instructions were right there. So, uh, yeah, I need I need those drafts so I can see the uh, progression of uh, the essay as you went along through the draft through the uh, writing process. So I I do need those rough drafts. Uh, two of them. The yeah, the revision draft and then the perfect draft from this week. 
Okay. All right, I see you there. What's your question? Yeah, my question is that the like uh, tomorrow we have uh, our deadline is for the paper actually. So are you going to like provide like an individual like a like a something like to submit our paper or something like that? Yeah, you have yeah the uh, uh, submission deadline or the uh, uh, due date for this essay is tomorrow. Uh, if you have to turn uh -huh. it in late, uh, there is a one week grace period on that. So uh, anything later than that, and you start losing points. Okay, okay. All right, Samuel, let's see your hand there. What's your question? Uh, so I just wanted to clarify this. So tomorrow the final draft is due, and the, you also want the other drafts that we've done after we've already uh, had them revised possibly. So, like, let's say I post mine tonight and I have it revised by a teammate or two, and then tomorrow I make the adjustments, and then that'll that'll be the final draft. Right. Okay, and then you also want, in addition, a uh, rough draft that we personally worked on, you know, like how I've, I've maybe done some work previously on the paper, and then I am completing my final draft today, or my revision draft today, and then my final draft tomorrow. I yeah, I, I want I want the yeah, I want yeah. the revision draft you turned in last week, and then I'll and then I want the proofreading draft that you uh, submitted to the group this week. In addition to that final. Okay. Draft. I got you. Yeah, I'm a little okay. late on the uh, rough draft, obviously. So uh, my bad on that. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We got about two minutes here. If there's any, if there's any more questions here, uh, stick, stick around for two more minutes here to answer some questions. Hello. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so if you submit, so I went submitting the drafts. With your final draft, like you're able to tell, um, like how much progress we've done from the uh, beginning of the rough draft to the final draft, right? Yes. Okay, let's make it sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Thomas, can I see your hand there? What's your question? I'm kind of a little confused. Uh, I only have two papers with me. Uh, is one of them is from this week, uh, uh, the one I posted on my group discussion. And then one of them is a final draft that I edit everything, and that's my final one. When you say, well, we have to submit the third paper, that the progress we made, like, I don't have any third paper. That I could. Did, you, you, you didn't submit a revision draft last week? Oh, no, I don't. I didn't done that part thing. Okay, well, uh, at this at this point, uh, really, uh, just just submit just submit as much as you've got. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Uh, that's uh, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, so uh, everybody, uh, stay safe out there. We will uh, commence this again same time next week. We'll be talking about uh, evaluation essays, uh, which is the next thing you guys are going to be doing. So uh, stop the recording here, and I will see you guys uh, in the lectures and on this session next week.